So I felt, oh my gosh, say no more. Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to the Euclid Township Board of Supervisors August monthly meeting. Um, let me go ahead and call the meeting to order and ask you all to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, on nation, under God, with liberty and And before we begin, I'd like to announce that the board met in executive session to discuss personnel on July 9th, July 10th, and July 23rd. And on that note, I also want to um, welcome our new township manager who is with us tonight for our first monthly meeting, Mr. Bobby Kegel. So I hope you would all say hello to Bobby after the meeting and welcome, welcome him here. We're excited to have him. Right, with that, I will move on to the minutes of the July 8th board meeting. Is there a motion for approval of the minutes? So moved. I'll second. Is there any board questions or comments? No. Any public comment? Go ahead and call the vote. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Motion passes. And the August 5th special meeting and workshop meeting. I move to approve the August 5th special workshop meeting and special meeting minutes. Any questions or comments? I'll, I'll second it. Perfect. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Any public comment? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Moving along to our reports, we'll start with our police chief, Chief Alexander. Uh, thank you and good evening. For the month of July 2024, the Euclid Township Police Department officers documented 1,112 entries in the police department call reporting system. During the reporting period, the officers issued 94 traffic citations, they investigated 36 motor vehicle crashes, and they arrested 27 individuals. Additionally, for the month of July, the department members conducted two motor carrier details at the weigh station, resulting in 891 commercial motor vehicles being weighed, 10 of which were found to be overweight. During the details, the officers performed 18 inspections, requiring seven vehicles and three drivers to be placed out of service. During the details, the officers were assisted by members of the Nether Providence Police Department, the West Goshen Township Police Department, the Coatesville City Police Department, the Westchester Borough Police Department, and the Upper Chichester Township Police Department. Uh, year to date, the officers have documented 7,334 calls in our call reporting system. They've arrested 125 individuals. They've issued 697 traffic citations, 331 uh, warnings. They've investigated 214 motor vehicle crashes, and they have put 5,418 trucks over our scales. Uh, and I believe for the month, there were no Narcan administrations. Great, thank you, Chief. Treasurer's report. Good evening. Um, through the month of July in our general fund, we've collected just under 63% of our budgeted revenues and have spent just under 65% of our budgeted expenditure. Thank you. Public Works. All right, let's see if I do this right. Mm -hmm. uh, daily average flow to Downingtown Treatment Plant was uh, just shy of 1.3 million gallons per day. There were no new connections to Dara or Eagle View. Township received 2.88 inches of rain. Normal is 4.7 inches. Uh, we've received 25.32 inches of rain since January, which is 1.88 less inches than the normal rain total of 27.2. There were 206 PA1 calls for July, and the sewer department performed various preventative maintenance tasks. Uh, Pine Creek Overlook and Sierra Drive pump stations are operating normally. Uh, we did have generator usage at both Pine Creek and Overlook for uh, due to the storms. Structural repairs to the Eagle View wastewater treatment plant are 98% complete. Uh, we have a second third party inspection taking place here shortly. Once completed, sandblasting and tank coating will begin. We did receive a change order request to expand the scope of sandblasting and tank coating uh, to include all piping mechanisms, boxes and troughs uh, within the walls of the tank. We're working through that. Milling and paving were completed for the Beach and Maple Street project and we'll be monitoring the stormwater in that area moving forward. We also received a quote to uh, address the ship road trunk sewer pipe, uh, which crosses Route 100 and requires repair. Um, 
we're working through that quote and working with Gannett Fleming to make sure that uh, we have all the right pieces in place to execute that. Our staff televised uh, just shy of 5,000 feet of sanitary sewer main and 400, just shy of 450 feet of storm pipe in July. The paving program for 2024 has been completed. Cobble Skill, Kimberly, Travis, Tessia, and Whitford Hills were paved as part of that program. Uh, the resurfacing program for 2024 is nearly complete, including Woodland, Calvary, Steeplewood, Harshaw, Silver Fox, and Valley View, uh, and various road maintenance projects were completed. We uh, installed new stop signs on Timber Springs and at the intersection of Dallin Forge and Shellmire. Uh, catch Basin and other uh, repairs were, were made and uh, various other maintenance projects were completed. And we all know that there were significant storms which impacted us on July 16th and 17th. Public Works Department, I think, did an outstanding job of preparing for and responding to the damage, including deploying generators for traffic lights, closing roads, and clearing trees and debris as quickly as possible. And I know uh, while we're specifically speaking about Public Works, but everybody within the township did an incredible job of responding to that, the police department, the fire department, the ambulance, and just everybody involved. So thank you. Thank you. The fire marshal? Yes, uh, for the month of July, the department issued 107 permits for construction. A total of 129 inspections were conducted. 16 fire inspections were completed. 46 use and occupancy certificates were issued. And the uh, fire marshal responded to 26 incidents and one burning complaint for month. Thank you. Lineville Fire Company. Yes, for July, the Lionville Fire Company responded to 86 incidents. Uh, breakdown by municipality is Euclid 51, Upper Euclid 10, West Pikeland 4, and 21 in other townships. Uh, so far this year, we're at 429. Thank you. And Euclid Ambulance. Uh, for the month of July, we responded to 131 calls in Euclid. 441 for that month. In total, we're at 3,040 calls. Great, thank you. Are there any board questions or comments regarding the reports? No. Nope. Um, okay. I'll make a motion to accept the reports as presented. I'll second. Any public comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. All right, moving along to our business agenda for this evening. First up, we have a presentation by the Downingtown Library. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Smith. I'm the new ish director of the Downingtown Library. I started in February, and six months is actually today. Oh. So I'm getting used to being there and getting a better sense of um, what we do, how we operate, and how we serve the community, including yours. So I want to make sure that everybody has a library card. Yes, if you don't, you're not free. <laughs> Lots of free services to go with them. Uh, so we have lots of library card holders. We added 197 people last month. We have about 11,500 library card holders in the county. The, this sheet here is our general statistics for last year. We are on track to have a similar number of customer visits and circulation for 2024. Um, we are very busy every day, all day. Um, we have lots of people coming in. We offer many, many programs, and most of them are booked full. We have a fairly small program room, so we typically are fully booked um, people on a wait list if we have one available. And you can also get a brief financial overview at the bottom of this sheet. Now, we are kind of at the turning point in our sort of publicity and calendar. So we're going from summer reading, which ended on Saturday, into our fall. So at the end of the month, we'll have a new fast fact sheet that covers May through August. But this gives you a little bit of an idea of the usage by locations. You can see in the spring, Euclid had 3,503 checkouts. As of last week, that number for the year was up to 9,571. So the people of Euclid are using the library frequently um, and enjoying the materials that we have there. 
And our program attendance in the winter spring for children was over 2000. I can tell you that just in the month of July, that category had 1200. So our May through August statistics there will be really strong as well. We have a great summer reading program and hundreds and hundreds of children enrolled and participated. They went through the solar system reading and um, redeemed various prizes along the way. So that was a lot of fun. We also had a great Harry Potter birthday celebration naturally on July 31st if you're a Harry Potter fan. We had 301 people attend that event. Um, and it wasn't just kids. I was the sorting hat. I had people ages three to 83 get sorted by the sorting hat. So it was really fun. Um, and then this is our sort of spring program overview. We are finalizing what we'll have available for fall, but you can get a good sense. We have young children's programming um, throughout the week. Those are incredibly popular. We in the fall will also have drop in story times happening regularly, which has been really nice for everybody who can't get a spot in our very quickly booking up children's programs. The drop ins are open to everyone, so they still get some story time. Um, along with our knitting and crochet groups, we also have a very dedicated gentle chair yoga group that meets regularly. And our adult programs, the board game night and film forum groups are so passionate and so dedicated that they talked us into doing twice a month for both of those activities rather than just once. Um, now we received Euclid support for 2024 in June. Thank you. We really appreciate your support and we offer these services to the community and we're really happy to see the community using them. Speaking of special events that might happen, when those storms pass through on July 17th and 18th, we had over 500 people in the library each of those days, many of whom did not have power. So we had Wi-Fi. So when I came in, every flat surface had a laptop on it. Didn't matter if it was a table. If it was flat, it had a laptop on it. Uh, we had running water bathrooms. We had air conditioning because the next couple of days it was very hot. So we had a lot of people relying on the library um, to work remotely, um, just kind of be comfortable, um, get water out of the drinking fountain. So we're there for those kind of things as well. Um, looking ahead, we are so in demand so busy that we are looking at an expansion project within the next five years. So as you are thinking about budgeting going forward, think about the library. Um, we're just bursting at the seams, which is a wonderful problem to have. Um, but if we had more space, we would be able to offer particularly more space in programs, more spots for young children to join story talk time. Um, and more spots for more adults to do some gentle chair yoga. So we'd really like to be able to expand opportunities for some of those programs. Um, what we can also do with slight increases to funding includes bringing in more expensive program guests. So for example, we had two programs in July from the Marshall Steam Museum on STEM, science, technology, and engineering. They were particularly interested in trains. Uh, those were fantastic programs, but they are more expensive to book. And many of our STEM presenters are because they're going to be bringing materials. The kids might do experiments, activities, um, and they may they often come with particular expertise, so their time might be valuable as well. Um, so we love bringing those programs in, but they tend to be a little more expensive. And the other place we're putting any additional budget is toward extra desk staff. We check out 200,000 items a year, um, plus all of the other questions and concerns and help with computers. We help people print all the time and all kinds of other computer type questions. So our desk staff work very hard. I spent an hour today being a desk staff person um, because sometimes they just need an extra pair of hands. So that is what we do with any additional funding that our municipalities are able to provide. Do you have any questions about the library? Look. You looked thoughtful. I'm just, well, I'm just curious if you have a specific amount that you're asking, because I think you gave us a specific amount last year, and that just helps us for budgeting purposes. 24, 
uh, you provided 15000 which is approximately $3 per person for the 25% allotment that Downing Town has for Euclid Township. Um, now we're looking at the next year's funding formula, and they may be shifting some of that township assignment around. So if our proportion of the township changes significantly, then we would hope that the funding would adjust to match so that where it's going now comes over to us since we will be assigned to uh, a much larger proportion of your residents. Um, but um, the the three dollar per person rate is what I would call sustaining support. So that kind of allows us to do what we're doing now. Um, but we're growing, the township is growing, our surrounding municipalities are growing. So increases in funding, um, even if it's like a 10% increase, helps us start to meet some of that growing demand and need um, so that we can continue to make sure we have enough people available to check out as much stuff as people want um, and maintain our collection and make sure that we have plenty of copies of everything that's new and exciting. And also things that are um, cozy and familiar, all of those children's books that people love and, you know, that, that get what we say loved to death on a regular basis and need to be continually released. So we have both the freshest stuff and the most comforting stuff in the library. Any other questions? Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. All right, next on the agenda is our Heart of Euclid Nature Learning Trail update. I think Ms. Tony Gorkin is going to be heading that up. And she's brought show and tell. <laughs> Sure. Can you stand? Sorry, can you just stand in the microphone so that anyone who's listening online can hear? You can take you can turn it around if you need to or hold it. Yep. Yep. Thank you. All right. Um, what I want to ask right, is the part of enjoy nature learn for it. So the kind of support of the part really how long you need to expand in the yeah. Um, this project uses the natural facilities of the bar, the ponds, the plants, the insects, the frogs and toads, and all of it to formulate this learning trail and uh, the community to be used to communicate uh, major education to the public. Uh, the trail. That's our available. We starts at the kiosk. There are 15 stations. And uh, you can start there or at any station. Most of them are marked by these attractive uh, birds. I'm sorry, I'm not standing in front of them. Anyway, um, these were donated to us by Longwood Gardens. They came from the Critter Tree, if any of you were there last winter. Uh, when they were done with them, they gave them to us. And we've used them to mark the various stations. Most of them have a marker of this time. All of the stations QR code. This, this QR code is... Um, if you use your smart device, your phone, you can open up a chapter. There is a manual with chapters for each of the stations. And at each station, the QR code will take you to that chapter. And you can read uh, about the various natural things, the trees, the flowers, the garden, the insects, all of those things that are along the learning trail. Uh, the purpose of the learning trail is for everyone, but it's specifically aimed at families with children who might want to use the park to walk around, do some education with their kids. Um, and we have, so we have, in addition to all of these materials, we have a backpack. 
that the family can borrow that has a note the full handbook in it, some guide materials um, explaining about the butterflies and the various wildlife and plants in the park, and uh, some small child type. There's some child um, uh, measuring devices, magnifying glasses, and so forth. So the family, a family, if they would like to, can borrow this and walk the trail with it and return it at the end. Um, the question, the links are to the whole, there are links to the whole handbook and to the whole map available on the kiosk and you can use your phone to get started and launch those. I particularly want to thank you, the, uh, thank the Heart of Euclid volunteers who have helped make this possible, especially Kathy Tracy, um, Jim Orley, and um, Julia, who has been very instrumental in creating the code for these for these uh, QR codes. So I have, I would like to present Julia. <laughs> Uh, two years, two years ago, I gave these to the key volunteers part of the team, and they became members of the Red Handle Brigade. So, <laughs> <laughs> this leap in technology. So just a little background on the Hardigan Fund project. It's in its fifth year. Uh, it came out of my training as a PA master naturalist. And the goals are to, to introduce more biodiversity or to provide examples for the public to get educated on sustainable kinds of planting, how to plant a pollinator garden, wetland garden, a variety of and in general to support sustainability in, in the township. So I'd like to thank everybody. I'd like to welcome them to take a walk uh, through the park, stop at one station, follow them all, use the QR codes, and enjoy the Thank you. Good job. Be remiss if I didn't get a photo because that's like my job. Ah! In there, maybe. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Thank you. And while, do, while they're doing that, I'll just reiterate my thanks to the Heart of Euclid volunteers, um, as well as our historical commission, who together recently. Um, hosted a countywide stop at our township grounds to look at some of the historical and natural elements. Um, I had a little time on that day to stop by in between other commitments that I had, and I was pleasantly surprised to not be able to find a parking spot. It was so crowded. Um, and we had so many volunteers and community members that manned different stations to talk about different elements of our building, of the grounds, of the work that the Heart of Euclid team has done. Um, and it was just, it was great. It was such a diverse and interesting mix of people. And it was great to catch up with people and talk to everyone and just kind of celebrate the work that's been done here over the last couple of years. Um, I'm sure the staff will agree with me that over the last few years, every time I'm here during the day, there's more and more people just kind of walking around and enjoying the grounds and having a picnic lunch or looking in the pond or, you know, doing whatever. So I'm really glad to see that the public space that we've been kind of reinvesting in here is is being used and it's being used happily by our families and our community members. So thank you, Tony, and all of our volunteers. Anything else? Nope. Okay. All right, moving along to number three, Euclid Ambulance request for funding. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. 
and I'm going to turn this this way <laughs> so I can see the screen and see you all. And we, we've been to a lot of townships, and it's always nice to see the public because this is information we like to share with them as well. And if there are any questions um, from you all, of course, we'll take them, and we'd love to hear from the public as well. Thank you for giving us the opportunity um to have some time on your schedule um i don't have the clicker so just okay you can stop there <laughs> so this is our mission and vision it really hasn't changed um, we are primarily a 911 emergency medical response organization we do have a training institute and some other programs that we we'll talk about in a little bit but i wanted to just share a couple of photos on the left You'll see uh, some members of our youth group um, that I think was at Exton Community Day. Um, they do an awful lot for our organization. And in fact, the picture in the middle is of them teaching other people CPR. On the right is a picture of some of the equipment inside the ambulance. And on the bottom is some of our crew who were recognized by was it Paoli during EMS week. So we actually are more than 911. We do have, as I said before, our 911 services, our bariatric units, and standby services for events. We're also a training institute where we provide uh, certification opportunities for medical professionals, uh, organizations like child care centers, and we also offer free community uh, hands-only CPR and basic first aid thanks to a grant from the West Company. Um, through our training institute, we're also working uh, on workforce development with a grant from the Justamere Foundation to help educate new um, e people who want to be EMTs with scholarships. And the uh, grant was renewed, and this year we'll be able to provide some of our own staff uh, some scholarships to advance from EMT to an AEMT, an advanced EMT and even um, help offset the cost of paramedic school for any of our providers who are interested in that. And then I mentioned our youth before, we have a very active youth organization. We are, we lost 20 or, uh, through graduation and we are picking up at least another 23 and we still have a waiting list um, of another 20. So we have a total of uh, 40 kids, 40-ish <laughs> kids. Um, which is about all we can really handle with the mentors that we have, the space that we have, and the time that we, the time that our, our staff has. Um, it is um, probably the largest uh, EMS youth group in our general region. Um, they help us with, not only do they learn themselves, they also become aides on our truck. Some of them have become EMTs. Uh, through the scholarship program, they do all of our work at all of the work at the community events. So we have what we used to call the teddy bear hospital. We don't have teddy bears anymore, <laughs> but um, so they do a, a whole layout of teaching people how to do hands only CPR, uh, stop the bleed, how to get rid of um, old medications and a whole list of other things. Thank you. So I'm going to ask Cammy to talk about our latest program, Mobile Integrated Healthcare. So um, as Kathy said, we are 911, but we are uh, the first in Chester County to start a new emerging trend, which is called Mobile Integrated Health, which is non-emergent 911 care for our community. So what that looks like is we'll have specially trained paramedics called um, mobile in a health mobile integrated healthcare technicians who have a different set of protocols of practices where we can actually treat the patients at home versus being transferred 911 to the local hospital. So imagine yourself post-discharge from the hospital. Most of us don't listen to the post-discharge instructions, right? They get thrown somewhere. We just want to get snuggly in our bed. And the mobile, you call 911 24 hours later, because that usually happens within the 72 hour period. And now the crew gets there, they say, this is a mobile integrated health patient. This is not a 911. And that paramedic can actually treat you and take care of you at home 
link you to services, call your doctor, maybe pick up a prescription or get the prescription to you, teach you about your medications, do medication recs, do a home analysis. So there's many, many different ways this program can help our community keep people at home with the care they need. A big part of this is connecting you to programs in our community that are already there that a lot of people don't know about or are afraid to use or don't want to use. So we're using programs that are already well established. We've been able to get a contract with the Department of Aging to see their patients in our community. Um, homelessness is on the rise in our community and our area, especially in our seniors. So working with them to find social services and support that they need. And also the big part about this is that it frees our 911 crews for the calls they really need to be on. Because nationally about 75 to 80% of 911 calls are not 911. This is a big part of our mental health. So we've seen a huge spike in mental health calls over the last four years, especially after COVID, and to about 13% of our call volume is mental health. And to be able to pair those patients, keep that at home, pair them with a new um, Chester County Mobile Mental Health Program, and teach them about their medications so that it can sustain um, that care and support the family members who take care of them. So it's a little bit about it. This is 100% grant funded. So as we're asking for money, you're like, great, start a new service that costs money. Um, we were able to secure about half a million dollars in ARPA funding um, and with an additional 120 from um, Senator Fetterman for um, equipment. And we've been able to secure contracts to, to show sustainability over the next three years as we grow. So thank you very much. She gets a class all the growing, so we're about to get to the money part. <laughs> and I probably should have introduced us. I'm Katha Pizan, I'm the executive director at Euclid Ambulance Corps, and this is uh, Tammy Whiteman, who is our Chief of Operations and also currently our Director of Mobile Integrated Healthcare and three or four more hats, but they don't have titles. Um, so in Euclid Township, um, can you? Yeah, thank you. So our um, the population of our service area, this was actually 2022 data at the time I put this together. I couldn't, I, the 23 data wasn't out. Um, our population uh, in our total service area 75,200-ish, and uh, Euclid makes up about 25.5% of that. Our 2023 call volume was 5,062, and um, Euclid accounts for 31% uh, of that. I should point out, I think Tammy mentioned what the year-to-date total call volume was. We are on track this year to do about 5,500 calls. And in fact, there was one day about a week and a half ago where our crews did 31 calls in 24 hours. So over the last seven years, this is uh, all the townships that we cover all or part of. Um, and in Euclid Township, the is the top contributions? Because it's covered, I think. Yes, top is contributions, 34.9% uh, total uh, average over seven years with an average call volume of 32.1%. Um, so that's just some statistics about Euclid. This is how this shapes up in townships, the rest of the townships that we serve, call volume contributions. And keep in mind, we use call volume because that's something that people are familiar with, but there are a lot of other factors that go into how we serve a community. Um, for example, um, some of the smaller areas that we have, um, there's a part of the turnpike that runs through them. So it's not really about, you know, how many, uh, how many people live there, but the calls that are actually attributed to that township. And we also have to pay for the state of readiness. So our crews are ready 24-7, 365. So the problems that we're facing, these are not new. Um, we've had, we've talked, we've been talking about this for a while. Um, we've had stagnant revenues for a very long time. Primarily it's Medicare. So I'll just give you an example for an advanced life support call. We might bill, let's say $2,800 and we will get $400 in change from Medicare, 
that is the fixed rate and we are not allowed to balance bill the patient. Occasionally we can if they have supplemental insurance, but if all I have is Medicare, that's it. So literally every call we go on, we lose money. Um, even private insurance companies, it is taking three, four, and five times to have them reprocess the invoice till they actually finally pay what they were going to pay to begin with. So all of that takes time and it's a cash flow issue. Um, we are still facing skyrocketing costs. We'll talk in a little bit about um, capital, but I'll give you an example. We just purchased an ambulance completely empty. So it was just the chassis and the box, totally empty, was $307,000. And they're telling us that in about a year, a year and a half, that same ambulance is gonna be about a half a million. And that doesn't include the stretcher, the power load, the monitor, the Lucas device, the stair chair, and all the ALS bag and the BLS bag and all that other stuff that you saw there. Um, what's, so the first two aren't necessarily new, um, but what is starting to happen as a result of the first two is that we are, dipping into our reserves, um, in some cases to cover operating costs, which is a terrible thing to do. Um, and we are starting to have limited access to capital. And what I mean by that is debt. So on that ambulance loan, um, we could only get a loan from one bank at 8%, um, because the loan, despite having a significant amount of money in the bank, in our investments, um, the loan doesn't cash flow because we run at an uh, operating loss every single year. And finally, aging infrastructure. We can talk a little bit about that storm from a few weeks ago, which took our aging infrastructure and put a few more holes in it. Um, we had a giant limb fall uh, and, and put a few holes in the roof, roof which created uh, significant water damage. Um, in addition to the fact that I don't there has really been no improvements other than an addition to that building since 1975. Um, the uh, woodpecker has found a bunch of places to make a bunch of holes. Some squirrels like to nest in there. Um, the building is not going to fall down, but it's in dire need of significant repairs. Okay, so in the next five years, if we are looking at um, trying to find a way to either renovate or rebuild our station, we have uh, capital needs of just under $6 million. Um, our ambulances have a life. Um, we, we really, after about five years, we should be turning them over. Um, but we generally don't because we can't get a new one. Um, but we have seven ambulances we run four crews during the day and two at night. So you might say, well, why, do you, no, why don't you only have four ambulances? Well, because you need to rotate them. Otherwise, um, they wear out even quicker. Uh, stre power stretchers and power loads, I always get the cost confused, but combined, it's about $50,000 a piece. They have a life of seven years. They are, they are factory tested and will only be covered by a maintenance agreement for those seven years. So I can keep the stretcher in year eight, but that's a real liability for us. Monitors last about eight years. Right now they're about $43,000. Um, there may be new protocols coming down from the Department of Health. The monitor that will be required for that will probably be between 50 and $60,000. I will leave the rest of it. <laughs> so we have about $3 million in, pardon me, equipment and vehicle needs, and about, we think, maybe $3 million uh, to fix the building. So on the left there is just where our 2023 actuals ended up. You'll see we had an operating loss of 120000 ish and our 2024 budget was for an operating loss of about 150,000. We'll probably do a little bit better than that, but not much. And at the bottom, you'll see what our capital, capital purchases were, the significant increase in debt and decrease in our cash and investments. So our current request 
there's actually two requests. Um, we are requesting an additional um, funding in 2024 of $55,000 to help offset the cost of that $307,000 ambulance. We've also applied for a 2% state loan so that we can bring the um, the principal down on that 8% loan, um, but they will not refinance it at less than 8%, but at least the principal will be lower. For 2025, our estimated request for operating expenses from Euclid Township is 165,000, um, and for capital um, is 133,000. So that's the official request. Here we go. This is interesting information. Um, we implemented a new subscription program a few years ago. Um, and so we're able to get data by township. We mail in total about 25, 27,000 households, uh, residences. So in Euclid Township, we mailed 7,606 residences and received 1,538 subscriptions for a total of $146,000. A subscription, for those of you who aren't aware, um, is a little like an insurance policy, if you will. If you call for an ambulance and you have a subscription, you won't be balance billed. So the percentage return in Euclid is 20%. And of those 1,538 people, 345 gave additional donations totaling $23,000 for a total from Euclid residents of just under $170,000. On the left, you'll see our flyer, our subscription flyer for this year that went out, went out a little bit late this year, um, went out, I think the first week in July instead of the last week in June, and reminders will be out in the mail this weekend or next week. So if you got yours and you put it in the old circular file, when you get the new one, I would ask you to consider becoming a subscriber. Um, I wanted to thank Euclid for sending a couple of representatives to our screening of Honorable But Broken, EMS in Crisis, which is a documentary about the crisis in EMS, which is frankly a nationwide issue. This isn't a Euclid issue. It's not a Chester County issue. It's not a Pennsylvania issue. It is actually a national issue. So we appreciate um, that Euclid is sending some representatives. And I think that might be the last slide. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs> I'll just say I asked, I had the township had the pleasure of meeting with Euclid Ambulance, what, a month ago or so? And so I appreciate that conversation. Don't have any additional questions at this exact moment, but perhaps. I mean, so I guess my question is, and it's kind of seeing if you can see the future here. Um, you know, because we've, we understandably, because of the, of the crisis that you've described here, that we've been increasing our, our contribution. Um, and I just want to see, what do you think the rate of increases over, over the future? Since we're starting to talk about longer term, you know, how we are going to address this as it gets bigger um, internally. Question. Um, outside the real fix, which is a change in the way uh, EMS is funded, um, so we talked a little bit about Medicare, we talked a little bit about private insurance. Currently now, not in all cases, but in almost all cases, we only get paid by insurance if we transport to the hospital. So that model has to change. So that means if a patient refuses, we don't get anything. <laughs> um, so, and a lot of what I'm saying in general, there are exceptions to, to some of these things. So um, until that, issue is addressed. Unfortunately, in Pennsylvania, it is the responsibility of the municipalities to provide the service. The code doesn't say how you're supposed to pay for it. It simply says you're yes. supposed to provide it. Um, one of the panelists that will be there tomorrow is the chair of the Cowan Township Board of Commissioners. They recently were, um, I think there's about 10 now municipalities that have implemented the EMS tax. Um, they recently did it, and so he's going to be talking about that experience. But short of a major fix to the system overall, I think in Pennsylvania, 
that's where this is headed. If I'm honest, that's where this is headed. Um, I will say that it does provide relief to a municipality's general fund, right? Because that would be a specific tax dedicated specifically, you know, to go to the EMS agency and there's the fire tax as well. So that is what I think the short-term solution is because I think the bigger solution isn't happening anytime soon and maybe not even in the rest of my lifetime because it's a big fix. Wow. All right, thank you. Will anybody in the public have a question? Yes. So, being the new caption, um, so we get public to the uh, subscriber, we get them from line vote, we get them from the you know, Minkless? Minkless. Minkless. Um, and I don't really understand, I guess. So, where do you live? We live in England. Yeah, but like, Oh, right around here or yeah so 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 that would be lion so lionville fire company is a fire company only and euclid ambulance is an ambulance company only so in other places like downtown for instance make is both um right I, so i understand i I understand that sometimes that happens. We all use data. Uh, we've ended up sending subscription notices kind of like right across the line of where our territory is. So it could be um, that they just inadvertently sent you one. But according to my friend, Mike Holmes here, you are in Lionville Fire Company's district. <laughs> and you're definitely in Euclid, Town, uh, Euclid Ambulance's district. So for so the fire houses. Okay, so I should ignore that request then? Yeah. I'm not saying that publicly, That's but probably. <laughs> <laughs> So your primary um, fire and EMS coverage is Lionville Fire Company and Euclid Ambulance. That's it. Yes. <laughs> Right. So, so they, they would honor our that that actually brings up a question that I had. Do you factor in the resident subscriptions into like your funding formula for how much you're asking yeah, from each so municipality? So I mean, if, each, each municipality, so yeah. We use our estimate of subscriptions as revenue towards our entire um P and L to come up with the amount, you know, the, the difference, what we're short. Um, and honestly, even with what we're asking for for next year on the operating side, we're probably still going to be short, which is why that says estimated. <laughs> because at the time we had to start doing this so you all could do what you need to do. Our budget isn't completed yet. Right. So we make a lot of assumptions. I have one question. Um, do you have municipalities within your first coverage area that have required household subscriptions through like the land development process or through conditional use process? So not required. Um, there is currently, we currently only have one uh, from a project that was built a few years ago in West Whiteland Township, um, Arbor Terrace, and they um, gave us a $30,000 donation before they started building and they committed to buying a subscription for every room in the facility. Um, so it stays with the room. So if the resident moves to another facility or passes away, that subscription stays with the room. So whoever is in that room who needs an ambulance and when we, and Arbor Terrace is 
currently considering also buying an, a mobile integrated healthcare subscription for every room. Um, and as Tammy said, that is a completely separate program with its own revenue. It is not um, supported in any way by operations. In fact, the half a million came from, it was the county that we got the ARPA money from. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh. Is 22% subscription well, I don't know. Just the low version right now. Uh, you know, we try to get it out there and we're saying that and we get it in the boost the Excellent. Yes. Yes. And, and support the fact that there's a oh. Well, and that's why we do three community CPR tests today. Sorry. Sorry for hijacking your meeting. <laughs> so, excuse me. Um, the graph that you can capture just the contributions are supposed to be in line with. Yes. You sort of shoot. The population, not all answers. That is correct. And can you speak for that at all? I can only tell you they've been getting the same presentations for the last five years. Can we split that back up? Is it like much from that split there? I think, can we probably make this available via the website or? or is it accessible on your website? It's Just for, it's not. Uh, so that would be up to them if they are happy. They want to send it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Like upper you. Like upper you. Right. The substation. And well. Don't. And I think I think it is also fair to say that over the last three years, our asks have increased substantially, right? And so, you know, when an ask might have been thirty thousand dollars four years ago, it's now one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. And you know, every township is in a different place, and I don't profess to know, nor do I want to know what their financial situation is. That's for them to decide. But it's a good question. Right, and so they, just for historical context, when, when Mamie and I first came on the board, we, we were, I don't think we were giving you, I think we were giving you zero. Yes, exactly. So we, we increased it to 30 because that's what you were asking at the time, but as you can see, like, 
and that's what my question was really geared towards a couple minutes ago because it's just it's going up and if you're following the news and it's kind of a niche uh, news item but if you're following it it's all across the state and country but if just focus on the state like it's it's a real issue almost everywhere and especially in the, in the suburban areas i think today an article about a nine-year-old girl in massachusetts um, all of the local ambulances were out. Um, some of them were doing wall time in the hospital. They called 911. There was no ambulance there were to come. The fire service came. They ended up taking the young girl to the hospital, I think, in the fire chief's SUV. Um, but she did end up passing away. Um, so, you know, the question to put to the public across this country is what if you call 911 and nobody came so i think this information would be better in some public website yeah. we don't have near the website traffic to sit down yeah. 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 the only people who go to our website are people looking for training pretty much yeah and, and i'll just bring that full circle by saying we've already started as of last month in a public forum discussing our work, our budget, and, and we have that um, scheduled for workshops throughout the rest of the year. This was kind of a, a mini topic last month, just because we had just met and we were looking at your requests moving forward. But certainly there's opportunities for the public to learn about and provide comments on um, how we move forward as a municipality and address the challenges because it is a service that we that we need to provide and that's necessary. Um, so certainly many more conversations to come. And I appreciate your time and the information, and I look forward to the event tomorrow. Happy to see you. And you all can be our best advocates because when you tell your neighbor or your family or your friends, that's when it means something to them. So thank you. Thank you. All right, moving ahead to items four and five, which we're gonna handle together is an appointment to the Park and Recreation Committee. Um, the board uh, is appreciative of Mr. Tarun Menderada, um, who has volunteered for both positions um, and vacancies for the Park and Rec and Community Day Committee moving forward. I'll make a motion to appoint uh, Mr. Tarun Menderada to both the Park and Rec Committee and the Community Day Committee. A second. Any comments or questions? Yeah. Any from the public? Seeing none, I will go ahead and call the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Moving along to number six, approval of SALT bids. The bid opening for the SALT bids was on August 7th. Eastern SALT Company is the low bidder at $70.20 per ton. Last winter, they were um, $74.58 per ton. Um, based on results, it is recommended that we award the bid for sodium chloride um, at seven, $70.20 per ton to Eastern Salt Company of Lowell, Massachusetts. I move to award the bid for salt to Eastern Salt Company at $70.20 a ton. A second. Any questions or comments from the board? No. From the public? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Moving along to number seven, permission to re-advertise bids for snow contractors. Um, last month, we were here seeking permission to advertise for this. Um, as, of, um, as of now, we have not received any bids for this, and we're looking to re-advertise. And we will be back to you with those results at the um, October meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, number eight, permission to advertise for GreenLight Go 7 program. Okay. We have to, we have to, don't we have to, she said she's going to bring the bids back. Like, we're, we're, this is permission to re advertise. Oh, I'll, um, oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'm, I'll make a motion to um, grant permission to advertise, re advertise the bid for snow contractors. A second. Any questions or comments? Yep. Sorry, I was avoiding the reality of snow. <laughs> Any public comment? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. 
Now, number seven, permission to advertise for Greenlight Go 7 program. Okay. This um, Pennsylvania Department of Transportation Greenlight, Greenlight Go 7 grant um, involves traffic signal equipment improvements um, at 13 intersections within Euclid Township. They're all along the 113 corridor. Um, it will provide its upgrades to the video and radar detection system on most of the approaches there. Um, bidding of the project will be done through PennBid, and construction must be completed by May 15th, 2025 with this grant. Well, I'll make a motion to uh, approve permission to advertise for the Green Lake 07 program. I'll second. Any questions or comments from the board? The public? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. And number nine, resolution number 2024-11, endorsement of Landscapes 3, Chester County Comprehensive Plan. Mr. Cagle? Before you, <clears throat> excuse me, before you use a resolution endorsing Landscapes 3, the county's comprehensive plan, by doing so, you're essentially saying we acknowledge it exists and we'll take it into consideration <clears throat> when making planning and land use decisions. But there's nothing which binds you or any other entity from following it or using it as an definitive information source. Landscapes Free has the township identified as suburban and suburban center. Suburban landscapes are predominantly residential communities with locally oriented commercial uses and community facilities. The focus is really on residential neighborhoods with enhancements in housing types and affordability. Neighborhoods are interconnected by roads, sidewalks, and paths with convenient access to parks and community facilities. Suburban center landscapes have varying land uses accommodating commercial, residential, and industrial with a focus on sustainable development. Both suburban and suburban centers have a preservation focus looking to preserve and reuse historic buildings, preserve and restore stream corridors and other critical natural features. They also both focus on bicycle and pedestrian facilities and improved connections between uses, new parks, central greens, public community gathering places, streetscaping, artwork, and other really placemaking elements. And finally, they're both, they both focus on expanding public access to natural areas and trails. All elements, I think we can agree, define the township and have been a focus of the township over the years. The last piece I really want to touch on with Landscapes 3, and perfectly honest, uh, one of the driving forces on recommending endorsement, is the access to funding this provides. The county currently allocates $10 million a year in open space funding for preserving land and farms and developing new parks and refreshing existing parks. We're also able to utilize that funding to leverage tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars in state and private funding that's available for those, for those efforts, as well as $250,000 a year to help municipalities accomplish projects such as zoning ordinance rewrites, transportation planning, and other planning activities. Uh, and for those reasons, we are recommending that uh, the board endorse landscapes through. Excellent. Thank you. We'll make a motion to approve resolution 2024 11 endorsement of landscapes three Chester County's comprehensive plan. I'll second. Are there any questions or comments from the board? No. Nope. Any comments from the public? All right. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and call the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. All right, moving on to the announcements. All meetings will be held at the Township Building unless otherwise noted. noted. On August 21st, the Zoning Hearing Board will be meeting at 7 p.m. to render decisions for 1037 Welsh Airs and 411 Lightfoot. On September 2nd, Labor Day, the Township offices will be closed. On September 3rd, the Board of Supervisors Workshop meeting will be held at 12 p.m. On September 4th, the Planning Commission will meet here at 7 p.m. 7 p.m., right? 7? Yes. Sorry, it wasn't on the agenda. Uh, and on September 9th, the Board of Supervisors will be meeting here at 7 p.m. I also wanted to point out, forward-looking a little bit, on September 21st at 9 a.m., um, Euclid Township will be hosting a National Cleanup Day along our adopted route of route, uh, our adopted stretch of Route 100. There's information on our website and our social media on how to um, RSVP for that. It's a good opportunity to come out, keep our community clean, and meet some of your neighbors. Feel like you've started your day off doing something 
positive. So I would welcome you all to join us. Um, and with that, I will open to the public for any comments. We'll start here. First, I have Laura and Don Harding. Thank you. My name is Laura Harding. I live at 301 Brookwood Drive, which is exactly where the detour happens at um, Peck Road because they've been working on the bridge now. We are now at the end of the seventh month that that detour has been happening. And everybody comes right exactly where it happens and goes down Philman, which has made traffic there very dangerous for those of us who live there. And in addition, has caused a great amount of pain and suffering for the residents there. In addition, um, we also have. I'm sorry, hold on just one moment. I don't, I don't want to not be listening. We can wait till okay. I can come up here. Okay. Yeah, let's just we'll fix this after. Sure. We'll come. In addition to all of that, we also had a filming by HBO on the land directly across the street from us that um, used to be called um, used to be owned by the French family. So the house is abandoned, and there's a whole bunch of acreage there. And I believe there's a plan to put in a subdivision there, lots of different houses. They're going to eventually take that down. But over the summer. While the detail was also there, HBO is also there filming, filming all night long, very often, and causing a lot of pain and suffering for the residents that live there also. Um, and what has happened is that that stretch of Peck Road is a mess. It is a mess. It is filthy. I have gone out numerous times cleaning up trash left by the HBO people not to mention trash left by all the people who are working there. In addition, um, it's just a mess with piles of logs and trees that were cut like 15 or 20 feet up and are just sitting there looking really horrible. Hmm. Um, and I would just like to know if there is by any chance, if there was any monetary compensation by HBO to Euclid Township for the use of that land and the use of that abandoned house and could there is there any way we could somehow get the township to help clean that up i'm happy to go out and clean up whatever area i live in and we do that every year we sponsor a clean up every year and i personally go out and clean up peck road on an ongoing basis i can't move those logs and trees and branches it's an impossible for me to do that could we please clean that area up? Could we please use, if there was any monetary compensation by HBO, use that money to benefit the people who live on Peck Road and the people who live in Brookwood? And that was my request. And again, thank you very much. I know that this Peck Road project is coming to an end. God, I know it will, I really do. And I've been looking at your website and I appreciate all the information you put out on the website to let us know that that will indeed be coming to an end and we are greatly looking forward to it. But there's, there's that mess is still gonna be there. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Don Harting, Laura's husband. Uh, we live at 301 Brookwood. And uh, first, I want to say thank you for all the support that the uh, township has given us. Uh, we had some litter problems uh, a lot when the HBO people were uh, leaving a whole bunch of trash on Peck Road. And the township uh, responded and the police, uh, the police supervisor, excuse me, chief of police responded. And we're very appreciative of that. And thank you, too, for the way the township supported the police, uh, supported the uh, annual Earth Day trash pickup there at uh, at Brookwood. This year, the traffic was a real problem because of the detour. We ran that Earth Day trash pickup uh, in very, basically on, on the same roads as the detour. Excuse me, that's my timekeeper. Um, and uh, two police officers showed up and helped direct traffic and, and keep the keep the roads safe because we had children uh, picking up the trash by the roads. Right. So we're very appreciative of the ways the township has helped us out. Uh, we would like, I'd like to second what my wife said, and that is 
uh, both sides of Peck Road are a real problem right now with respect to logs, uh, trees that are cut off at 20 feet, plus a whole bunch of fallen logs, fallen trees, uh, overgrowth, uh, weeds, trash, all kinds of problems like that. And we just asked the township uh, either to take advantage of, the, of now when the road is closed to send the public works department down there to load up those logs and, and get them out of there and, and then uh, cut, the, cut the underbrush with a, with a brush, uh, brush hog or whatever, or take some other actions to clean that up. Uh, when you look at their comprehensive plan, that's supposed to be a scenic, it's, it, there's a green line uh, drawn along it. It's supposed to be a scenic route with intrusions. Well, it's mostly intrusions now. It's not very scenic, let's put it that way. Uh, and then I'm trying to remember the last point that I wanted to make. Oh, uh, our neighbor, our Peck Road neighbor, uh, Chris McQuail, who you may know, um, has volunteered the use of his tractor um, to help with a cleanup. And he has said to me, hey, you know, if you can get your homeowners association out there, we'll on, we can have some homeowners with my tractor and maybe the township and we'll get this all cleaned up. Uh, that seems like it's a potential. Uh, so we might have some sort of a public private type uh, partnership to try to clean up uh, Peck Road, the Peck Road embankment. So I guess that's about Great. all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I don't have anyone else on my list. Is there any other public comment? All right. Uh, seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Um, oh, I'm sorry. Can we fix we that? To we need to fix the salt bid really quick. Yeah, we um, mistakenly only awarded a bid for sodium chloride, but we also need solar salt and de-icer. We only use sodium. Oh, okay. So we don't use the other, we don't use the other things. Thank you, Katie. No problem. That's all that we use. So we're in consortium. So okay. That's all we use. There's other townships that go out to bid. So we save money that way. Okay. So West Bradford Township is the one who runs the whole thing. They okay. um, get, they do all the paperwork, get all the bid out. Um, and then they send us this, these are the results, but that's the only type of salt that we use. We don't use all the solar stuff or any, any of that. So that's all we put in for. So that's why the paperwork you got from West Bradford has them all listed. Okay. But I only spoke about what we use because there's really no need to speak about that. That makes perfect sense. Thank you so much for clarifying. Okay. Phew. We're good. All right. What would cost to get pink Himalayan? <laughs> Okay. All right. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Now, all in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Thank you, everyone. After the meeting, we will be initiating uh, the conditional use hearing for the Calvary Chapel of Chester Springs. Um, so, additional use here. Stick around if you're interested in that.